the problem. ...by companies as the next generation of credit cards. The data transmitted instantly by radio waves. No swiping, no signature. But some computer experts warn these new cards being issued by the millions may make shopping faster and easier, but they make identity theft easier too. This pair of computer scientists at the University of Massachusetts recently went online and bought one of the radio wave card readers the stores use. They collected 20 cards from colleagues and friends and with one beep, they were able to pull up the name, card number, and expiration date on all 20. Smart cards broadcast a radio signal that reveals your name, credit card number, expiration date. Sensitive data that's supposed to be encrypted. Researchers found all they needed was a homemade frequency reader tucked into a briefcase, and bingo. They could read the data in a sealed envelope or in your back pocket. If I can stand next to somebody so that my briefcase is about four inches away from their pocket for about half a second, that's enough time and enough distance for me to get their information. My, my students don't actually smell like that with the little stench lines, but, but that was an actual read of a, an actual uh, RFID-enabled credit card. So a lot of what I do in my lab is try to figure out why these systems work. And uh, there was one more example I'll quickly go through, and that is a colleague of mine uh, had figured out how to reverse engineer car keys. Um, there was a particular chip used in car keys and also in payment systems at gas stations. Uh, so here's a quick video showing how little time it takes for him to copy a key uh, from somebody sitting next to him. This person has a key in their pocket and he's going to copy it. An attacker waits in a public area such as a train station or waiting room. He pretends to be working on his laptop. Inside his attache case, he has hidden a small antenna. With only a few seconds next to a victim with a speed pass in their pocket, the attacker can recover all the information necessary to simulate the tag. Again, so there was an example of we were asking the question, well, why does this technology work? And it turned out it didn't quite work as was planned. So moving on, that was uh, this contactless technology. Another kind of technology we looked at was software updates. So how many of you have ever seen one of these kinds of dialog boxes pop up on your computer screen? Oh, nobody? <laughs> so what do you do when this dialog box pops up? You click OK, right? I mean, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? So that's what most people in my laboratory would always do. And we decided, well, let's see what we could do if somebody clicks OK. And actually, we were able, my, I gave my students a, a computer, and they were able to take complete control of my computer because it had done an automatic software update of its antivirus program. And instead of downloading the legitimate update, it downloaded one my students had crafted, which did something malicious. Um, and so this is something we take for granted. And again, asking these why questions helps us uh, to remove that kind of uncertainty. Now, updates happen in all sorts of places. They happen in car engines. Uh, they also happen in uh, medical devices. So the last major topic I'm going to talk about is implantable medical devices. So what protects a pacemaker or an implantable defibrillator from these kinds of security and privacy risks? And again, another bunch of why questions. How does it work? So we spent a couple years in my computer lab learning how does a pacemaker work. So the first thing we did was we got a pacemaker. Uh, so this is about three centimeters, so what, one inch? It's 2.54 centimeters, I believe, if I've taken my correct physics. Um, and uh, you can see on the right-hand side is a, a, a gentleman, an x-ray of a gentleman who has an implantable defibrillator. It has some electrodes uh, that are uh, woven essentially through the blood vessels and then connects to the cardiac tissue. So we wanted to know how it worked, so we took a file to it, started opening up this, uh, uh, this pacemaker. And as you can see, a lot of this is just a battery. About half of the volume is a battery. And at the top, there's uh, a small microcontroller and a, a little copper antenna. You can see that copper coloring up there is used to wirelessly communicate. And at the very top, there are a bunch of ports, just like a USB port, except it happens to control the heart. There's a sister device to the pacemaker called a defibrillator. And there's not enough time to talk about the nuances and the slight differences, but suffice it to say that both these devices uh, control the rhythm of the heart. So how does it work when a pacemaker is implanted in a patient? Because we have to ask these why questions. Well, the way it typically works is the doctor first sets some patient information by using what's called a programmer. So here I have a picture 
of this device programmer, and next to it is this small mouse-like device that's actually a wand. It's a, a wireless radio device, and it's used to set uh, initial settings like the name and things like that on the pacemaker or defibrillator. The next step is a 90-minute surgical procedure uh, done under local uh, just a local anesthesia, and the patient is awake but slightly sedated, and they place this device beneath the, the clavicle. Uh, the electrodes are uh, um, also implanted, put through the blood vessels, and at the end of the surgery, the uh, team of uh, healthcare workers needs to make sure that the device is working properly. So what they typically do is they induce what's called ventricular fibrillation, which is a deadly heart rhythm, and they see if the device works. Uh, I asked, does the device, what if the device doesn't work? And they said that doesn't usually happen. <laughs> Afterwards, uh, the patient is typically given some kind of at-home monitor so that they can uh, do checkups from home wirelessly. So then my why question started. I said, well, I want to know, can we build our own programmer from scratch? So we took a software radio. This is a computer board. And we hooked it up to an antenna that I removed from an, a discarded pacemaker. And we built our own programmer, essentially, a rudimentary programmer. So this slide kind of summarizes about a year of effort of a team of graduate students. But as you can see, we were able to retrieve quite a bit of uh, private information just by listening to the radio waves going between the pacemaker defibrillator and this reader that the physician would be using. So you can get things, for instance, we were able to find the patient name, diagnosis, the name of the hospital, all sorts of uh, personal information. But was, what was a little bit more disturbing was we f discovered that we could turn off therapies. We can actually disable the electrical therapies that are meant to uh, sustain the heart. So here's sort of the big uh, what if question. We wanted to know what stops a wirelessly induced fatal heart rhythm? Why couldn't someone just wirelessly induce a fatal heart rhythm? So we, we tried to do this uh, in vitro, by the way, not in vivo. Uh, but we, the first step was we disabled all the therapies. And then we sent a wireless command to induce fibrillation, this deadly heart rhythm. And with those two in a row, what that meant was the, the, the device would just ignore the fatal heart rhythm. So you don't have to have too much imagination to think what could happen through this, uh, through this kind of problem. So what about future threats? Um, we're all constantly asking these kinds of why questions. Uh, there are all sorts of problems, but could computer viruses come full circle maybe to humans? You know, there was this uh, uh, gag uh, uh, newspaper sold on supermarkets in the United States. Apparently, they already figured it out that the computer virus spreads to humans. It's a highly reputable journal. Their, uh, let's see, their tagline is, the weekly world news, the only reliable journal. <laughs> but I do want to give you a little bit of good news, and that is wireless technology can improve healthcare, can improve this kind of pervasive healthcare. But if people don't ask enough why questions about security and privacy, we're not going to be able to have all these wonderful devices to treat chronic illnesses. And I'll just close with that. In my research, I like to answer the why question by re-implementing things from scratch. And I briefly talked to you about these everyday devices ranging from contactless RFID credit cards to pacemakers and why they need security and privacy. And I just encourage you to find your passion uh, and try to make some everyday object from scratch, and you're probably going to learn something. Because in the end, uh, I learned how to make a better sandwich, and it made me a better scientist. So thank you.